here we are. Here we are. And I'm really glad you're here. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 2. But I, before we get started, I've got some Christmas factoids for you. I don't know the difference between a fact and a factoid, but factoids is a cool word. It's kind of fun to say. So you can take these uh, things to your Christmas gatherings along the way, but, uh, and you can maybe um, people will think that you're really cool if you know these things, and maybe they'll not. Maybe they'll just think you're goofy, but either way, you're going to get a few factoids today. You know how there's this, um, there's this notion that we're not supposed to say Merry Xmas because you're taking Christ out of Christmas? You know how that's, that's said? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Are we going to stare at each other blankly all morning, or are you going to be with me here, right? Taking the Christ out of Christmas. X is actually the first letter in the Greek alphabet in the name of Christ, right? So it actually has been used since the 1500s as a way of saying Christmas, Xmas is not taking Christ out of Christmas. Did you know Tiny Tim in Charles Dickens' classic novel, A Christmas Carol, was originally slated to be Little Fred? See, now you, see, now you have material for your family gatherings. If you add up all of the gifts in the 12 days of Christmas, there are 364 of them. So now there's a little trivia. You could actually go through the story, the song, and add them all up and see if that's true. Christmas was originally slated by Julius, uh, Pope Julius, Bishop of Rome, in 350 A.D. That's when Christmas became the celebrated, recognized day of Christ's birth. We don't actually know what day he was born, but December 25th is the official day since 350 A.D. It became a national holiday in America in 1870. Do you know the first person to decorate a Christmas tree as recorded in history was Martin Luther? That's kind of interesting. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the tallest Christmas tree ever decorated was 221 feet tall, came right here from Washington. It was a great big dug fir, and it was, it was uh, set up down at Northgate Shopping Center. World record. How about that? All right. You guys don't care about these things. You're going to care about this one. This is, remember, I, remember a couple weeks ago I told you that if you're wise, you never try to catch snow with your mouth? Until all of the birds have flown south for the winter. Remember that? Right? This kind of goes along with that. And if you didn't get that, it's probably okay. Mistletoe came from the Anglo-Saxon word mistelton, and it means little dung twig. Little dung twig, because the plant spreads through bird droppings. So if you find yourself under the mistletoe smooching somebody, at the moment of the smooch, I want you to think of that. Little bird droppings spread that dung twig right there. Now, a, 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 a few of these I'm pretty confident on, uh, but some of, I didn't fact check any of this. So if you, if you do read through the 12 days of Christmas and do all of the math and it's not 364, this is my disclaimer. I didn't actually fact check that. All right, let's get, let's, let's get going. Now, um, this... This next week, I, I was thinking about this. I named my, this title of my sermon, The Named Beneficiary. Be, uh, and this was in my mind because the next week, Jesse and I are going to redo our life insurance policies. And we're just going to do that. And um, if you've ever taken out a life insurance policy, you know that one of the things you have to do is you have to name the people that are going to get the money when you pass away, right? So you, you have a named beneficiary, and, um, and I'm, I'm not going to name you as my beneficiary that I know of. Maybe I'll just write it in and you'll be a big surprise. The key with it is you don't tell who your beneficiary, you don't tell your beneficiaries how much you're insured for because you might be worth more to them dead than alive. So you don't tell them if they're your beneficiary, especially if it's a lot of money. So I'm probably not going to uh, we're probably not going to, you know, like insure ourselves for a whole lot. But this is one of the things you have to do. You have to tell, you have to name your beneficiaries. You have to tell the insurance company who gets the money when you pass away, right? So here we are in Luke chapter 2, and it's, here, here's this paramount Christmas text, and God is naming the beneficiaries of Christ's death. And it's right on the heels of Jesus being born. And so we get this, we're told what these benefits are. We're told who gets, who gets the benefits uh, when Jesus, who comes by way of a, a manger, who comes as a babe, but it's ultimately so that he could give his life, bearing 
the sins of humanity that we might be released from the guilt and condemnation uh, of, our, of our failures before God. So this is the Christmas story, and it's really like the classic, original Christmas scene, Luke chapter 2, and, and we're going to study it in three parts this morning, so we're going to go through 20 verses, but we're going to do it in three parts, and this is the progression of it. What we're going to see is that there's a decree made, and the decree brought about the arrival, and the arrival brought good news, and then the good news brings comfort and joy. So that's the progression this, of, of this text this morning. So there's a decree, it brings the arrival. The arrival brings the good news, and the good news brings comfort and joy. So that's where we're going to be this morning, all right? So let's look, let's look at these first seven verses as we see this decree that brings the arrival. It says, In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. So again, we've got this classic Christmas scene. Most of us are probably familiar with it because of, you know, nativities and that sort of thing. But in our series, these last couple of weeks, we've been following uh, kind of a normal uh, pregnancy pattern, just kind of the broad strokes. Traditionally, there's this initial announcement, hey, there's a baby that's going to be born. And then last week, we looked at this waiting period. What, what happened to Mary? What was going on there during this waiting period? And we saw that she had went and traveled, visited with her, with her uh, relative Elizabeth. And so we've had all of this waiting, and now we're at that point of arrival. And it comes uh, where it comes because uh, it's, it's brought about by a, a decree. I'm going to define this term for you just so you, so you know. A decree is an official order issued by a ruling authority. That's a decree. And it, tell, it says here in verse 1 that Caesar Augustus is the one who issues this decree. And Caesar Augustus is a kind of an interesting character. You can validate this outside of Scripture, even in, in uh, just normal world history. Caesar Augustus was... Um, Certainly, one to be able to issue a decree. He he is um, he's the first. The Roman Empire has been around for a long time at this point, uh, but he's the first Caesar to be an actual emperor. Prior to Caesar Augustus, who was born Octavius, he was uh, before Caesar Augustus. The Roman Empire was ruled by the Senate, and then Caesar Augustus becomes the first kind of monarch figure of the. Of the Roman Empire, right? He he takes on this name Augustus, um, and and if you're familiar with world history, church history, this is actually kind of an interesting turning point because prior to uh, prior to Julius, uh, I'm sorry, Caesar Augustus, prior to him taking the title Augustus, that word was only used for the Roman gods. It means holy or revered, and so and so. This man here now begins to proclaim himself to be one of the gods, and in fact, as he exalted himself even beyond that. So in church and world history, if you know, a couple of decades later, as the church began to form and there was persecution that was taking place, and for the next 300 years, Christians by the thousands were tortured and killed because they wouldn't say, Caesar is Lord. They wouldn't say it. They refused to confess Caesar as Lord. They would not denounce the lordship of Christ. And many of them died horrific deaths because of that. That started right here with Caesar Augustus, right? So, so he's, he's known as the one who brought peace to the kingdom. So, so he's seat, seated in the most dominant seat of world power the world has ever known at this point. Rome was a, a world power, a world force that ruled its enemies with an iron fist. So he was one who is said to have brought peace to the earth, but he did so by bludgeoning his enemies into submission. He was the great nephew of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar adopted him and appointed him as his heir. And this man seated on the throne in Rome at this point is uh, when he issues a decree, everybody listens to what he's saying. 
So everybody now throughout the Roman Empire is traveling to their home of origin so that they could take, they could be a part of the the census, being counted in the census. Uh, They did that for conscription into the military. So they knew where to find a person and they could draft them into the military and they did it for the purposes of taxation. So when Caesar Augustus says, go to your hometown and be counted in the census, everybody does it, even pregnant women do it, right? There wasn't anybody that was going to say, you know what, it's a little inconvenient for me. I live in Nazareth, Bethlehem's a hundred miles away, and I'm pregnant, I'm not doing that. Nobody said that, right? So Joseph and Mary, who's with child, travel from Nazareth down to Bethlehem to be counted in the census because Caesar Augustus said, do it. It's interesting, isn't it? But when I reference the decree that brought the arrival, I'm not actually talking about, Ju- uh, about Caesar Augustus' decree. He issued a decree and people followed it. But the decree I'm not referencing is God's decree. In theology, in the study of who God is and how He functions within His creation, there is something known as the decree of God. It is a monolithic subject, and great minds have a difficult time wrapping their minds around it, right? It's, it's, not a li- it's not light reading material when you talk about the decree of God. But did you bring your thinking caps this morning? Because I want to talk to you a little bit about the decree of God. Because it really is God's decree that brought about Caesar Augustus' decree that brought about the arrival of Christ in Bethlehem. So let's talk about the decree of God. Again, it's, it's, it's a big subject, but let's put our thinking caps on a little bit here this morning. God's decree. So we defined a regular decree, just kind of general dictionary definition, as an official order issued by a ruling authority. But let's define God's decree. God's decree is God's plan for all eternity made before the beginning of creation. So stop there for just a moment. And you could realize right there, like that's why it's difficult to wrap your minds around this. That God, who is an eternal being, His eternality means that He knows everything from the beginning to the end and from the end to the beginning. That God is not locked into any sort of time dimension. That He knows everything even before it happens. That He is not discovering things along the way. That would be known as the the heresy known as open theism. God is not learning anything, friends. He already knows everything. He always has. So He issues this decree eternally before there's ever any any sort of creation. God knows what's going to happen in the earth. And it includes every event in history, even the meaningful choices of humans. So by taking that understanding of the decree, we recognize, as I understand Scripture, that we have the ability to make meaningful choices. That we're not free agents as in we can do anything and everything we want. There isn't any of us that are going to fly out of the room this morning because we want to. We're not free to do that. God has relegated us to certain things. We're not going to liberate ourselves for more than a little bit from gravity. We're not free to do those sorts of things. So we have a a relative amount of freedom whereby we can make choices that are meaningful choices. We're not just robots or pawns being moved around. But by the decree of God, He already knows. The decree of God says that he, in, in the decree of God, he has already declared what's going to happen. He already knows these things. So I, I took, um, I did my seminary work down at Western Seminary in Portland. And uh, it's a tremendous seminary. Uh, really, I, I just consider it a world-class um, uh, school. And I, I took theology from three different, uh, three different professors down there. Ryan Lister, Gary Bershears, and Todd Miles. And these guys... I mean, they're just they're godly, gracious men, but brilliant geniuses. Uh, you just love to sit and listen to, to them. But Gary Bershears was made a particular impact, and he's the one that taught uh, in this vein of theology on the decree. And he gave, for me, he, he gave a little story that helped me understand the decree. And I want to tell you, the, I want to give you the picture of this, okay? It's a little metaphor. Are you ready for this? It's, it's, um, it's called the ship theory. So, in the ship theory, if earth were a ship, then all of us are passengers on the ship, okay? And God's the captain of the ship. And as the captain of the ship, God is going to get this ship 
precisely where he wants it to be exactly when he wants it there. Right? The passenger, passengers on the ship are active, but they're not steering the ship. We're busy doing things. We're making choices that matter. They're meaningful choices, and we're engaging in life. And many people on the ship are making choices that are off the rails, terrible choices. Nonetheless, they're on the ship, and God is steering that ship. Now, even though we have a, a relative amount of freedom on the ship, we only have so much freedom on the ship. There are certain things that we have no, we're not going to be able to engage in that realm whatsoever. It's outside of the scope of the freedoms that we have as passengers on the ship. And there isn't a single decision, uh, a choice or action that any single passenger on the ship can make that will in any way disrupt or disturb the captain from getting the ship to where he has ascribed it to be according to his decree. Does that make sense? So, God is at work in all things. But we could say that He does not cause all things, that there are things that happen on earth that He does not cause and that He does not approve of. But none of those things frustrate His plan, His decree. He is in complete control. The prophet Isaiah said it like this, the Lord of hosts has sworn As I have planned, so shall it be. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. We're not going to in any way disrupt or thwart the decree of God. Okay? In Ephesians chapter 1, we're told about Christ that in Him, people who are Christians have obtained an inheritance. Move on to that next verse, please. Isaiah, I mean, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. In Christ, those who are Christians, those who have submitted their lives to the Lordship of Christ, received the forgiveness of God, been reconciled to God and gifted with eternal life. We have obtained an inheritance in Christ, having been predestined. The predetermined plan of God is that those who submit to Christ will receive the character of Christ that God gives us. He, he gives us His righteousness, gifts it to us. We don't earn it. Gifts it to us, right? So we have obtained this inheritance, having, pre, having been predestined. Look at this line here. According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God works everything. While I said he does not sanction every action, he's given us meaningful choices, some of which are not according to the will of God. But he works everything according to the counsel of his will. So God is eternal, He knows everything eternally, and He is in complete control of all things, and He always, God always accomplishes His will, but not everything that happens on earth is the will of God. He does not cause every action, but He works every action according to His will for His glory and for the good of His people. That, friends, is the decree of God, as I understand it in Scripture. So in our narrative text this morning, when it says, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Friend, there was a decree that went out long before Caesar Augustus existed that was going to ensure that the Christ child was born in Bethlehem. Long before there was such a thing as the Roman Empire, long before there were any towns in that region of the world, the decree of God said, this is going to happen precisely, exactly when and where. God said, this is how it's going to be. Right? So when I say a decree brought about the plan, it's God's decree that we're talking about here. Caesar Augustus issues the decree and he orders everyone in the Roman Empire to make their way to their town of origin so that the census can be taken. But friends... God ordered the decree long before that happened, right? Caesar's order is according to his authority and for his purpose, but God's order is according to his authority and his purpose. God's decree pinpointed where the Savior would be born, precisely where the Savior would be born. And this was God's plan for all eternity. In all of the earth, in his decree, he said that the the Christ child would be born in Bethlehem. In Judea of Bethlehem, right? And in the course of time, he has revealed his plan. So the decree goes out before in all of eternity, right? Before there's any such thing as time, before there's any creation, the decree is that God is going to step into his creation. The creator is going to step into his creation and be born as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem of Judea, in that precise spot. So as we said a couple of weeks ago, 
that God, God has progressively revealed his will to us as, as his creation. That he didn't, from the very beginning, disclose everything. The people back in Genesis don't know what we know. Because God has progressively revealed those things. And we took a brief glimpse at it as we looked at the various covenants of God. We looked for a moment at the, at the Noahic covenant, the covenant God made with Noah post-flood. We looked at the Abrahamic covenant that God was going to make with Abraham, that he would bless all the people of the world through the seed of Abraham, who is Christ. Right? And then we looked at the Mosaic covenant, the law of Moses, and then we looked at this covenant that is revealed in 2 Samuel chapter 7, known as the Davidic covenant, which was the promise of the Savior. That promise made to David that there would be an heir, one of his heirs would sit on the throne, and it would be an eternal kingdom. That was the promise of the Messiah that was made back in the decree of God. That the fall would happen, that mankind would need a Savior, that God promised the Savior, and that came by way of the Davidic covenant. Well, the Davidic covenant was given 1,000 years, roughly, 1,000 years before the the events that are taking place in our text took place. 1,000 years earlier, God said, I'm going to make a covenant, it's the eternal covenant, with David and his lineage that will be for all people, for all time, an eternal covenant. It'll be the last one, right? It'll be an everlasting, unchanging covenant. And that is the covenant that we know as the new covenant, the the New Testament, right? That in Christ we have, we are reconciled to God. So, but but that was said a thousand years before the events of our Luke chapter two text. Then, three hundred years later, during the during the time of the prophets, what we know as the prophets, Micah the prophet, Micah chapter five verse two pinpoints that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. That he would be from old. He, he, Micah says that he, he, the Savior is coming and he's in the line of David, but he's long before David. Right. This, is, this is the decree of God. That the Christ child being born in Bethlehem would be a fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. That it would be a fulfillment of Micah's prophecy according to the decree of God. So Caesar's decree is really just serving God's decree. Right. The Savior arrived right on schedule. We don't, we don't know how how long or how far along Mary was in her pregnancy, right? If you, if you read the text, it, it says uh, that, that while they were there, verse 6, while they were there, the time came. We don't know how long she was there. Right? And, and some of the older translations like to insert the word that she was great with child, but when you look at the original, con- the, the original text, it's not very conclusive that she was great with child. We know she was post third tri- uh, first trimester, because we looked at last week's text, and she was with her, her, nep- uh, her relative Elizabeth for the first trimester. Right? So we don't know quite when she made her way from Nazareth to Bethlehem, but at some point, they traveled that hundred miles, and that, that was, I mean, can you imagine? I, some of you ladies can imagine this. I've had a heavy backpack on and traveled several miles before, but I have never been pregnant and traveled many miles. I don't know anything about this stuff, friends. Um, I got in trouble one time because, so, 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 so she says, while they were there, the time came for her to have birth, to, to give birth. And, and, and so my understanding is that like if we're in this moment, while they were there, the time came. It's time to give birth. My understanding is that there's a lot of pain involved in this moment. But I don't know anything about it. I got in trouble one time with Jesse's grandmother, Hilda, precious lady, precious lady. She had a little bit of New England breeze about her. Have you ever, you know, somebody, sometimes people from the East Coast are just a little chilly, right? And, uh, and, and um, so she, she wasn't into my sense of humor at this moment, evidently, and, uh, because Jesse has three sisters, and they've all, they've all uh, had lots of kids uh, and, and, but we, we don't know anything about it because we adopted all of our kids. So I, I was teasing, you know, I just teasing one time. And Jesse's sisters happened to be talking about how difficult it is. It's painful and such. And so I, you know, I, I was teasing them. And I just said, you know, I just don't think it's that big of a deal. <laughs> and I know I just <laughs> probably made about three dozen enemies, Right. Just, I, but I was just teasing. I was kidding. And so I, you know, I had to rub it in. I said, it's like, you, I heard you girls, you cry about getting a hangnail. 
So it's hard to know whether this is that big of a deal. I just don't, I just don't know that it is. And Jesse's grandmother overheard that. And she kind of squinted her eyes a little bit at me. And she leaned forward and, and she says, I don't think you get to have an opinion about that. Whoa, I was like, <laughs> Grandma Hilda, I was just kidding. I was only kidding. So I, it's a big deal, okay? It's a big deal. The time came for her to give birth. This is the, this is the moment, right? There, but listen, look at, I'd be like, there's no, there's no medication for Mary here. There's no epidural. This is a natural birth. She's giving birth to this baby, and it's a big deal, right? It's a big deal. This Savior arrives right on schedule. He's right at the right place, right at the right time because of the decree. Not Caesar Augustus's decree. That got him there, but that was according to the decree of God. God's decree brought the arrival. And then we see the arrival brings the good news. Let's go on to verse 8. And it says, in the same region, that would be around Bethlehem, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom God is pleased. Wow, this is spectacular. We see from eternity the decrees made through time. God reveals himself and this, and, and this, this decree brings about the arrival. And with the arrival comes... The good news, friends, the good news has arrived. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes, cloths, this babe. This is the good news. He's now on scene. And this good news is announced first to shepherds. I think this is kind of interesting, right? We know that God does not uh, show favoritism. God does not discriminate among people. But we also see, like, like laced throughout Scripture, that he is particularly fond of the lowly. God's heart is particularly bent toward the orphan, the widow, and the poor. We see that throughout all of Scripture, not in a discriminatory sense, not in a favoritism sense like we as humans would express it, but we see that God, and I think it's because of their humility, the, the lowly find the heart of God because of their humility. And here we are told that these shepherds, these lowly shepherds, they were not in the upper echelons of their society. They're out in the fields taking care of sheep. So they're, 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 they're men, they're, they're smelly, which isn't necessary. Not all men are smelly. I guess I could point that out. When they're teenagers, they are. It's just the way it is. But not necessarily always, right? And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them and filled them with great fear. This is the natural reaction of anybody who actually sees an angel. All of the testimony and all of the scriptures, when people see angels, they freak out, right? They start unraveling, and the angel has to say, don't be afraid, right? So we get this announcement of good news, first to a lowly band of shepherds. But I, but I think it's worth, it's worth remembering why would God reveal this good news to the shepherds first? Why, why is that for them? And I, and I think the connection is that God himself is a shepherd. Right? D David recognized that. So many people, even that aren't familiar with the Bible, are familiar with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? God himself has said, I watch over and care for my people. I am a shepherd. And so that he would, that he would reveal this good news to shepherds, it's, it's no, like it shouldn't be a big surprise, right? Even, even G, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd because I lay down my life for the sheep, right? So, so the shepherds are chosen here to be the ones who are, get the first announcement, but the good news isn't just for the shepherds. Notice it says, the, the words of the angel, fear not for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, here it is, that will be for all of the people. 
it, the good news is told to the shepherds, but they're told in that announcement that it's not just for them, that there's not a select group of people, the passengers on the ship. There's not like a certain group of people on the ship that are getting the good news. The good news is for everybody on the ship, right? You follow? The angel attempts to calm their fears and delivers them this, this, is the, this word good news here is the Greek, the Greek form of the word gospel, right? He's giving them the gospel right here. And this, the, the coming of Christ is for all of the people, and this is good news, that He has come for all people and all who receive Him experience the joy of being reconciled to God. This is great joy. It's good news of great joy to be reconciled to God through Christ. This is the good news, gifted with eternal life. And I don't know, I look at this and it might be one of the most majestic, beautiful, powerful statements ever made. And the angels then tell them to substantiate that what they're saying is true. They tell them ahead of time what they're going to find when they get to Bethlehem. You're going to find a baby, and he's going to be lying in a manger, and he's going to be wrapped in swaddling cloths. So, the good news is peace with God with, uh, through Christ our Lord. This is the news that was given. But we have to, again, we recognize it is for all the people, right? That's what the angels said. Again, we, we just pay attention to the text as it's written, right? Good news, great joy. That will be for all the people. But then when we look down, we get to inspect verses 14, 13 and 14 again. All of a sudden, with that one angel that showed up, there's a multitude of the heavenly host, also known as, would be like an army of angels that burst onto the scene. They can't contain themselves any longer. It, the, the idea that these angels, they have been a part of creation on earth. They're spiritual beings who minister uh, on God's behalf on earth. This is the, what, what, what we get in Scripture. But they have been a, they've been a part of the whole chronology of mankind. So, so when Adam and Eve were created and God says, very good, right? When, when God was creating and, and gets to the pinnacle of his creation of humanity, and, and he says, this is very good. The angels are rejoicing with God and all of that. And then when, a, when Adam and Eve choose to disobey God and eat the fruit and become separated, they experience spiritual death, become separated from God. This, this is like the angels feel all of that as well. And then when God makes the promise of, of, uh, of Genesis 3.15 and what we know as the, as the first gospel declaration, the proto-evangelium, when God declares the gospel that he's going to bring a savior, that he's going to bring somebody who's going to crush the head of the serpent, that the, that the, that the, the, the work that the devil be, began in bringing sin into the world through the disobedience of the humans, that that work is going to be crushed and God's going to redeem the whole thing. When that, when that was declared, the angels have been waiting for this moment since then. We don't know how many thousands of years ago it was, but the angels have been waiting for this moment uh, 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 since that very time. And it, then so it says in verse 13, verse 13, suddenly there was this angel, uh, the, 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 with the angel was a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God. It's like they can't contain themselves any longer. They burst onto the scene and they start singing this song, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom God is pleased. So the good news, the one angel tells us, is for all the people. Now when you read the Hallmark version, it sim simply says peace on earth. Merry Christmas, peace on earth. And it feels so nostalgic and touching and heartwarming. This is where that came from, but they didn't do it justice because they didn't tell the whole story. The Hallmark version might say peace on earth, but that's not what the Bible says. Look at it again. Glory to God in the highest, and on, on earth, peace among those with whom God is pleased. That's different than peace on earth, right? Peace, peace on earth is not specific. It's quite vague and actually inaccurate. This says, peace on earth is among those with whom God is pleased. So that begs the question, who is God pleased with? Who has the peace of God because he's pleased with them? Huh? So that's a reasonable question, isn't it? We, the good news is for all the people. Let's, let's not miss that. It's for all. 
but not all have it. You see it? One day, some people came to Jesus in the midst of his teaching, and they wanted to know how to have peace with God. Uh, they had a works-based society that you had to earn your way to God. We, we still have some of that in our, own, in our own culture, right? We think that if, we're, if we try hard enough, if we do good, then somehow that we will have the pleasure of God and be at peace with him. This, th- they, were, they were similar in that way. So they came to Jesus and they said, this is John, John chapter 6, they said, what must we do to do the works of God? What, what do we have to do to be, to be um, at peace with God? What do we have to do to please God? And this is what Jesus said. He said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And there's a period at the end of that sentence. There's not a comma and say, oh, and here's another way. And then another comma and another way. There is, there's a period at the end of the sentence. The work that God requires, if you want to be at peace with him, is you have to believe in him whom he has sent. The decree brought the arrival. The arrival brought the good news. The good news is for all of the people, but not all the people get it. Not all the people receive it because not everybody believes in Jesus. You see it? God is is pleased to offer terms of reconciliation. Because of our sinful nature, because we are bent toward doing things that are offensive to God, and, and we do it on a regular basis, because of that, we are actually, as human beings, on, on hostile terms with God. The Bible says we're at enmity with Him. We're, we're, we're hostile to God. We're separated from Him. But God has come as the ruling authority and offered p- terms of peace. He's saying, I will reconcile with you. And we, of course, would then say, how do we do that? And, we, and He would say, I've given you my Son. He's bore your your sins in his body when he hung on the tree that you might die to sin and live to righteousness. Jesus Christ has been given as the way by which we can be at peace with God. But if we disregard Christ, we remain on hostile terms with God. If we're going to be at peace with God, it's going to be on his terms. If we think that we could make up the terms of peace and get God to buy into them, boy, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. The decree has brought the arrival. The arrival brought the good news. And the good news, friends, is that we can be at peace with God. But it's through Christ and through Christ only. Because only He has, only he has bore our sins. Only He is the one who paid the price. We can't, if, we, if, we, if we stand before God without having our sins removed through faith in Christ, we're going to stand before God guilty. So peace with God is offered. These are the terms. So the decrees brought, uh, brings the arrival. The arrival brings the good news. And then Christ's arrival ushers in the good news. Let's look at our last section here, starting in verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So again, you've got the progression now. You probably have it memorized. The decree brings the arrival. The arrival brings the good news. And the good news brings comfort and joy. As quickly as the angels had come onto the scene, they leave. And the shepherds are left there in the dark now, dumbfounded at what they had just heard. And what do they do? They say, let's go. We better go check this out. But notice, they didn't say, let's go see this thing that might have happened. Let's go see this thing, let's go see if this thing has happened. They said, let's go see this thing that has happened. They believed, friends, they believed this good news. It was delivered to them and they received it. They're confident. But what is this thing that has happened, right? We know know specifically that there's been a baby born in Bethlehem who is now lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloths. We know that. 
But, but that's not all that has happened. Or that having happened, there's more to that story that could be dug into. So what exactly has happened in this thing that has happened? Well, friends, the Creator has entered creation in order to rescue it. The author has written himself into the story so that he could be the hero and rescue those who are destined to perish. This thing that has happened, Emmanuel has come. God is with us. This thing that has happened, the Word, the eternal Word of God, has taken on flesh and made His dwelling among us. This is the thing that has happened. The Son has been given, upon whose shoulders the government would rest, whose name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This thing that has happened, this good news that has arrived, and He comes, friends, bearing gifts of comfort and joy. And the shepherds believed this, and they confirmed it. They hurried into town. They made haste. and they, we, we don't know how. Look at it. It says, and they, verse 16, and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. We, we don't know how long they looked. It's the same night, but we don't know how they found them. It just says, they went with haste into the town, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby. They confirmed exactly what the, exactly what the angel said. You're going to see these things, and that way you'll know what I'm telling you is the truth. They confirmed this good news, and then they begin to report it. Now, again, here we are in verse 17. And when they saw it, when they saw the baby, when they saw everything that was taking place here, it says they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. So that would be referencing back to what the angels told them. Right? Glory to God. Uh, I'm sorry, fear not, for behold, I will bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's the thing that the angel had told them. Right? And so they made known the saying that had been told them. So they believed it. Then they confirmed it when they found it. But then they started reporting it. They, they began to tell other people. But if you read it in its context, it's pretty apparent that there are other people present. Who are they talking to? He separates Mary out and talks about how she treasured and pondered these things. So the only person left would be the baby and Joseph. But there's other people here. Now, it's not the magi, it's not the wise men. The, the modern nativity scenes you know, always put the magi at the nativity, but they're not, that's not them. They're probably two years in coming. So it's not them, but there are people Evidently, there were people from Bethlehem who saw the commotion of you know, them trying to find their place in the inn and there was no room for them. And, uh, we don't know all of that, how that, how that took place, but the, these guys make known the saying that had been told them. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Whoever it was, they're in amazement. Everybody's amazed. They're in wonder at what the shepherds told them. They're like, wow, this, that's crazy, right? This is awesome. Mary is also in amazement, but we get this little picture of, of, of her, a beautiful glimpse into this young mother's heart. Mary knew the Hebrew Scriptures. Right? She knew the Messianic prophecy, and so she ponders, what's going to become of my beloved son? Hmm. So they believed it, and they confirmed it, and they reported it, but then I love, I love verse 20. I don't know why. I just think this is a great deal. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So they, so, they, so they just went off and lived it, friends. They just went off and lived. The shepherds went off and lived the good news. Right? What they had experienced was breathtaking. They, they had an experience with God that was fantastic, right? But verse 20 brings it all back to earth. You, you, you know, there, there are times I think there are certain people, maybe even certain personalities, who want to live life in such this like pizzazz-filled realm of like everything's got to be like a carnival all the time. Like it's, and it's like that's, I, I love these shepherds. It just says they returned, right? They had an incredible experience with God, and it's an experience that changed their lives forever, actually their eternity, but they returned. What did they return to? the sheep out in the field, right? They go back out. We don't know if it's still night. I don't know. We don't know, but they returned. You know, it's just that way, isn't it? 
We, we, can, we can have these wonderful experiences with God and we don't down, downplay them, we don't belittle them, we cling to them and it's wonderful, but the oil still needs to be changed in the car, right? The moss on the roof still needs to be treated, the laundry still has to be folded, bills still need to be paid. It's life, friends. It's the regularness of life. These guys returned to life, just the things that they're supposed to do. They're shepherds. Of course they're going to go back to the sheep, but they don't go back the same. They don't go back to the same way. They go back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So they were changed. They, these guys are still shepherds and they're still taking care of the sheep, but they're different people because they've experienced the comfort and joy of God. Right? And that's true of us as well. That, that God loves us with an eternal love, with a steadfast, loyal love, in spite of the things that we do that are offensive to him, he holds out his hand and says, here's my offer of peace. Take it on my terms. And I'll welcome you into my family. And these shepherds got that. And they returned. They returned to, to life, but they returned different because they had, they're now living the gospel Things, they're, they're still doing some things that they'd always done before, but they're not doing them the same way anymore. And that, that's just this, friends. This is my main idea this morning, that God's good news is for your comfort and joy. God has delivered this good news, and it's for all the people. It's for you. It's for me. God's good news is for your comfort and joy. And, and it's, it, it's not, um, I mean, it's, it, some of you love the holidays and it's very nostalgic and it's wonderful and others, it's very difficult time of year. This is not the superficial comfort and joy that I'm talking about because the Christmas lights happen to be plugged into the tree. Okay, that's, that's not the comfort and joy we're talking about. We're, it's not the same comfort and joy that you get because you've watched the 19th, millionth Hallmark Christmas movie. <laughs> and you're like, um, they're all the same. It's the same story. <laughs> and half the time, it's the same actors. Right? Not that I would know. I've heard these things. This, this, isn't, this isn't the comfort and joy that's like the nostalgic part of the holidays. This is, this is the kind of... Um, comfort and joy that settles the soul, that really possesses the soul because you know you have peace with God. So even, even if the holidays are not a fun time because there are disappointments or regrets or you know, broken relationships, you can still have the comfort and joy of God because you know you're at peace with God. That, that's what this is. God's good news is for your comfort and joy. Not just at this time of year, but for eternity. Because unto us, a Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for Christmas, Lord. We, we, uh, we're grateful for all of the various celebrations and such. But Lord, mostly we just want to say thank you that you have given us a Savior. You have given us a Savior. God, thank you that you have named us as your beneficiary, that we benefit from Christ's death. The good news is for us. Thank you, God. And I pray, Lord, for each person who's here this morning who knows that, that they would be reminded, that their hearts would be stirred uh, in gratitude and thanksgiving for you because you have been so good to us, Lord. And I pray for those who are here who don't yet know that. They have not yet received Christ as their Savior. That they would, Lord, that their hearts would be open, that they would receive, that this, they would recognize, even at this moment, that you have given them a Savior. And they would say, yes, Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. Forgive me, God. Forgive me for offending you, for sinning against you. Forgive me, God. Thank you that Jesus has paid the price. Receive me, God, 
into your family, not on my merit, but on the merits of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen.